Hey, Paul, thanks for raising your question um, in the Facebook comments. I wanted to just make a video in response because uh, it comes up a lot and I thought it'd be easier to make a video. So a couple of things you pointed out, I'm going to read them actually from your, from your question. You said, my observation is that when we are challenged or even feel insulted by that challenge, uh, it's because we internally believe what's being said about us. For instance, if your wife says you're ugly, um, you get offended because you believe it to be true. It's your internal dialogue, right? And this is a great and very true thing. And now where it gets a little bit confusing is, <clears throat> though it's our, our dialogue, we have to kind of define dialogue. We have a, a conscious mind and a subconscious mind. And rarely is the dialogue our conscious mind. The reason for that is we've been doing so long uh, and the way we're, we're created as humans is our brains automate anything we do repetitively. So because of this, it's such practice dialogue that few people recognize it. This is why people tend to have sometimes a bullshit response to me saying that this is your inner dialogue because they kind of look inward and say, I don't walk around saying I'm ugly. I don't think I'm ugly. But there's a difference between what the conscious mind believes and what the subconscious mind believes. And so there is a subconscious dialogue and it comes out usually via provocation. So when a, a wife or someone provokes us and we feel the emotion, that emotion is telling us that there is a dialogue inside, right? And this dialogue does contain at a very minimum an uncertainty about whatever's being challenged. So if somebody says you're ugly and you're triggered by it, I think it's fair to say, and it's been experientially and anecdotally true in the men I work with, that there is at least a subconscious uncertainty that uh, that I'm that maybe I'm ugly or a related peripheral anxiety that I need this person to like me for some reason. So it, does, it might not be that you genuinely believe that you're ugly, but that you see a consequence in this person thinking you are because you have a, a you know something else going on there as far as meaning that you see great value, uh, actually even necessity in the person who's saying this to you, liking you, right? And this is the kind of the, the deeper truth. So you went on to ask, you know, how, how do you go about correcting this, that you've talked about pa positive affirmations and all that. I don't think positive affirmations on their own really do much of anything. Um, same with hypnosis, for example, because it's way more complicated than that, although it's not very complicated. So um, I wanted to respond to that idea. And also you said, you know, I wonder what's worked for you. What have you done to convince yourself that all of the dialogue is bullshit? Well, as I'm making this video, Paul, um, it's just about the time when school is starting, right? And so um, every time I think about school starting, I think about kind of my own experience with school and I wasn't the best student in the world and yet every year come the time school would start I would kind of have this renewed enthusiasm for the upcoming school year and kind of a hope that I'd be a better student that this would be the year that I kind of got more diligent that I would be you know more academic that I would be I'd have an easier time staying engaged that my handwriting would improve all this stuff and what the triggering moment was every year that this would happen is when we would get new school supplies. So like everything was crisp. I get new notebook paper, new spiral notebooks, new pens, pencils, those wooden rulers with a little metal edge. I'd get a new, you know, in the earlier years, I'd get a new bottle of Elmer's glue, crowns, crayons, whatever you call them. And then, you know, in the eighties, the trapper keeper and anybody watching this video in their forties probably knows what a trapper keeper was or he is. Um, and if you're like me, you remember him then with delight. Like if I could buy a Trapper Keeper today, I would, but that's another video. Okay. So all these new school supplies would kind of give me this hope that if I, you know, this would be the year, this was going to do it. And it's just not that simple. You see, I didn't really have a problem with supplies. It wasn't my, you know, worn out clothes that were making me not a student. It wasn't my warm supplies that were making me a bad student, right? And I'll get to that in a minute. 
I see a parallel here, and the reason I'm talking about this first day of school thing is because men kind of do the same thing in crisis. They just kind of go back to the beginning. They go back to, well, what used to work, right? Um, or maybe like this idea, if I just freshen some things up, right, that's going to work for me. And so what they usually turn to is trying to start on the outside <clears throat> and improve things. So they'll, you know, they'll work out, they'll start intermittent fasting, that's a, a new one. They'll, you know, lose some weight, drink less, maybe get some hobbies. And they kind of have this idea, okay, this is going to be the time, this is going to be the time where I'm going to show up differently. Um, but what they're doing is kind of hoping if they just retool themselves, that that's going to make the change. Because like me in my student days, I kind of had this belief for a brief moment that I had a tool slash kit problem. And I didn't, Paul. What I had and what you have and what we all have is a story problem. See, everything in life is about story. So the quality of our lives will depend on the quality of the stories that we carry inside of us. And we learn these stories from a very young age. We learn stories about everything, stories how the world works, stories what a healthy relationship looks like, stories about how we believe you know, a husband should treat a wife and a wife should treat a husband. And we're just immersed in a culture that the, the common and universal language for all humans is story. So we have these internal stories about how things work. And when things come our way in our learning and our experience, what we don't realize is you're actually subconsciously, you're comparing what you're experiencing to your story. And it's the story that is teaching us and has taught us over time to suffer. And so when we are walking around with a low regard for ourselves, that fundamentally means that we have stories that have led us to believing that we are worthy of low regard. And so how did I get out of this? How does a man get out of this? Well, in really plain, simple, you know, uh, simplified and reductionist way to say this is you need new stories. You need to replace the stories that cause you to suffer with better stories, better stories that actually produce the results that you want in life, right? So if you have a story about being deeply emotionally disconnected, that's, it's the story that is causing the experience of life, right? We have this thing called a brain, and I like to call it my experience generating organ or my ego and my experience generating organ is basically turning my story into my experience so when we put a story in there that in the story itself it contains you know uh, despondent discouraging things it contains the idea that i'm not enough the idea that i'm broken the idea that I'm ugly, the idea that anything, pick something, right? We have tons of these things. But in all of our stories, they contain one common element, and that's shame. And shame means that we're comparing ourselves to something and we're coming up short. And so for all of us, if we have a shame story that goes into the experience generating organ, what comes out is suffering because that story is teaching us to suffer in our experience. But it's not the experience that's creating the suffering, it's the story that's creating the suffering. This thing right here is actually pretty damn remarkable. If we put a new story in there, one that is based on different ideas and ones that actually produce life-giving results instead of life-robbing results, we get a different experience on the outside of that because the story is what's producing the result. So when you have a story, that is a low regard for self, right? If you want a different experience, you have to supply a new story. You have to supply a story that meets the criteria and has the attributes necessary to end up after going through the experience generating organ of the ego with producing a great result. It has to be capable of doing that, right? Which means we have to realize, well, what is it about my stories that suck? Why am I getting these results? And what kind of things do I need in, in the stories of, of how I see the world to produce a different result? And when we make those changes, when we do this critical analysis, right? And people in, in our community tend to be pretty good at this because they're pretty damn smart, right? These are people that are academic, 
or their engineers or attorneys or their people that are used to very complex ideas. Well, these men can take their very robust brains that can do this work of, ana of analyzing their stories, understand the stories, and then see, oh, I see, this story contains this attribute, and, and, a, and when I get over here, here's how it causes me suffering. And so I teach men basically over six months, because it takes, it takes a good bit to understand this, how to do this process, how to see something back here and see the path that you know it takes in our lives and in our brains and our thinking in our psychology and our spirituality and see how it ends up in suffering. And so in a nutshell, all I can tell you in one simple video is that it all, it's all about stories. So you wanna stop suffering, you need new stories, right? And I don't tell men what the stories are, by the way, just as a caveat. I help them actually learn how to judge what is a good story that will produce the result that they want and help them see how the stories they already have are not doing that. And so I essentially help men write stories, right? They're the writer, they're the author. I'm just helping them kind of say, yeah, that's, that's looking like it's gonna be a good story. It's gonna get you where you wanna go. And at the end of the day, we all have to own our stories. We already do, really, right? But if you wanna get out of suffering, you have to become the author of your story. You have to realize that true. You have to replace any story that exists that says that someone else is writing my story because if they are, you're powerless. And so that's the kind of one of the first stories a man has to overcome and replace is the story that he has no agency in his future. Because if you don't, then you're gonna be pretty much permanently stuck in the idea that someone else needs to change or give me what I need because you're powerless and you're a victim. So when men do that and they realize, you know what? I can actually take this pencil, metaphorically, and I can write what the future looks like if I understand the stories that got me to suffering and I exercise my agency over them and I write the next chapters to be different. And I would suggest that's exactly what coaching and mentoring does, is we just help men with that process. And I do believe that that is the most effective process for transformation in a man because we need the input, um, the direct input of other men to help us with that because otherwise, all we have is our own stories. And so we start to borrow the stories and perspectives of one another and people whose stories have been working for them. And that's how you go down a trail and you get to a vista that's wide open and lovely and beautiful and filled with connection and intimacy and a great relationship because you followed someone there who themselves did the same thing, right? Anyway, I hope this has given you enough to think about. I hope you're you're gonna, you know, turn off this video and then give some consideration to the fact that your stories are causing you to suffer. And I hope you'll reach out if you, you know, if you want to think about this further, not just to myself, right, to any of us here that kind of know how to help write these stories. So with that, I'm gonna say goodbye for now, and I'll talk to you soon, brother. Take care.